Welcome to tonight's program, Get Ready to Write a 30-Day Novel. This is uh, part two. It's okay if you missed part one. Um, my name is Lauren Williams, and I'm an Adult and Community Services Manager for the Columbia Public Library, which is part of the Daniel Boone Regional Library System. As you likely know by now, uh, because you're here, November is National Novel Writing Month, NaNoWriMo for short, uh, where writers challenge themselves to craft a novel in just 30 days. And the library is a big supporter of um, all kinds of creative endeavors, so we are glad to be co-hosting this event. I want to thank all of our panelists for being here and uh, sharing their time with us and to give a big thank you to Art Smith. He is one of Columbia's municipal liaisons for NaNoWriMo, and he recruited tonight's panelists to share their wisdom and experiences with us. Um, so thank you all for being here. And to get us started, I'd like each of our panelists to introduce themselves um, by letting us know how many years you all have done this kind of crazy thing, and then um, provide one tip for successfully getting through NaNoWriMo. And we can start with Art. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Art Smith. I'm the ML municipal liaison for the Columbia region. So if you joined NaNoWriMo and made this your region, you can look forward or regret um, getting lots of emails from me over the next several weeks. Um, uh, this is my uh, 11th year doing NaNoWriMo. I've done it uh, for 10 years and succeeded on nine out of the 10. I didn't succeed the, the year that we moved on the, on uh, Halloween, which made life interesting. Uh, uh, the one tip I would give probably is to definitely set aside time every day to write, block it out on your calendar. Um, it's, it's easy to say, well, I'll write when I get around to it. And boy, that just never works. Um, so you, you, in order to, to win, you have to average 1,600 words a day. That doesn't mean you have to write 1,600 words every day, but you have to write something every day, even if it's just 100 words. Um, and, and that'll really help a lot with getting, getting over the finish line. All right, Chloe, how about you? Hi, I'm Chloe Pivril. I currently am in Fort Collins, Colorado, on the end that's not on fire. Um, I previously was in Columbia, Missouri. That's how I know art. Um, I'm a 2015 graduate of the Odyssey Writers Workshop. If uh, you're a sci-fi fantasy or horror fan, you might know that workshop. Um, and a member of Codex. Uh, my, I've been participating since 2009. The website says 2011 because in 2009 when I first joined, I was terrified and I ran away after about 10,000 words. <laughs> but I came back a couple of years later in 2011 and started again. Um, and I completed, I want to say six out of the nine. It keeps dropping my last one for some reason on the website. Um, my best advice is communicate with your loved ones and the people you lived with and the people that you're working with about what you're doing so that they can help protect your time. And so that they know when you are hunched over your computer or your piece of paper, whatever it is you're jotting on to leave you alone for a little bit and let you finish. That's good advice. Um, Genevieve. Hi everyone, I'm Genevieve Howard. I've been doing nano and most of those years I've won, but I've also lost. And even if there's a year where you don't get to 50,000, it's still a win in my book because any words written, those are good words that you didn't have at the beginning of the month. My advice would be to tell everyone you're doing this. It's an adventure, go for it. And then you start to build people around you asking, hey, how's it going with your writing? It gets to be really fun. Your coworkers will ask you. My husband, Logan, does it with me. He's right here. And we used to go to this cafe at campus, Mizzou campus. We'd go in every night after work and we'd be sitting there writing on our novels. And the people who worked in the cafe would say, what are you doing every night here? And we said, we're trying to write a novel in a month. And so then when we walked in the door, they'd start saying, it's the storytellers. <laughs> so it's really fun to just start telling people what you're doing and get your community excited and they'll help you. They'll give you energy to get through the month. 
that provides some accountability too, I would think. I'll keep you going. Um, Ida. Hi, um, I'm Ida Fogel. Uh, I work with Lauren too. So <laughs> I think this is my fifth year to do nano. The first year I did, I didn't get 50,000 words, but I won the last three years. Um, and last year I finished up the first draft of a novel that I had been working on. And then I finished out my words by um, writing some short stories. And one of those short stories has been published in the First Line Literary Magazine. So, so keep at it for five years. And <laughs> um, my thing that I have to tell myself to, to do it is I, I tend to be a slow writer because I overthink. And just remember, this is a first draft and it doesn't have to be good. You can rewrite it. So um, use placeholders. If you can't think of the name of the bait shop that somebody's stopping at so that they can meet the person they need to meet, you can just put in whatever, whatever bait shop. And, you know, highlight that. And when you rewrite, you can come up with the name for it. Don't, don't slow yourself down for 15 minutes coming up with things that you can fill in later. All right, Mary and Andrew. You go first. All right, um, I'm Andrew Bonk. Um, actually met Mary through Nano, so that's one thing. Um, mm -hmm. I have been doing this since 2004. And so it, it has been something where I've met a lot of people, been, um, and just made a lot of friendships. And that's actually one of my piece of advice is you know, the website has forums, uh, there's Discord channels. Um, we can't really do it this year, but the write-ins, and so we'll do like virtual write-ins, like get involved with those. Because when you're around the community of writers, that's just knowing that there's other people going through this with you is a really big deal that can help motivate you. I'm Mary Warner. Um, I've been doing this uh, 10 years. I've won every year since I met Andy. Um, so he's my good luck charm. He's lost every year since I've met him. So I'm probably a bad luck charm. <laughs> um, my, uh, my piece of, of advice is uh, surprise yourself. Just it's, it's going to sometimes you're going to sit down and you're going to write stuff that you think is crap. And that's okay because you're developing a lot more skills than just your novel. You're developing, getting words on a page and learning how to process information. So just surprise yourself and, you know, get stuff down. It doesn't have to be perfect. All right, all good bits of advice. Um, so just a reminder for the people who are attending, if you have a question for any of our panelists to please type that in the chat um, yes, or Sai. raise your hand. Oh, Sai, I'm so sorry. Go ahead and unmute yourself, sorry. You're totally fine, trust me. Um, my name is Sai. I've been doing it for 12 years. I am the ML Municipal Liaison for NaNoWriMo Tucson right now. Um, I have not won and I have not lost any NaNoWriMo's. I've simply written novels and made them awesome. Um, I don't think anyone's a loser when it comes to NaNoWriMo. If you write two words, that's two words more than you wrote in October and you deserve a trophy because you sat down and tried something you didn't do. As for my advice for NaNoWriMo, and my biggest thing is learn how to say no and learn how to say yes. So my no comes in, which is kind of what everyone else seems to be saying, and it's really cool that everyone, not everyone else kind of agrees, but learn to protect your writing time. So when someone says, hey, let's go get that drink, and you haven't written any words yet, learn to say no. Don't feel guilty about it. Just tell people ahead of time, like someone else mentioned, tell people you're writing a novel. Tell them, no, I'm writing a book. It's really important to me. Tell them no. And then when you're by yourself, tell yourself yes. So when you're sitting down and you think, man, this is what I'm writing is just such crap. I don't know what I'm doing. Tell yourself yes. Be like, you know, what? yes, this is not crap. Yes, this is the greatest thing that I've ever written. And tell yourself yes every step of the way, because if you tell yourself that you believe in yourself, you will, and then everyone else is going to, and you're going to have 50,000 words before you know it. 
So that's my advice. Excellent. Thank you, Sai. All right. So now if you have questions, go ahead and type those into the chat. Or if you want to raise your hand and ask them out loud, that's fine too. But I will kick things off with my question, which is, um, why do you subject yourself to this every year? Um, for you know, someone who hasn't done it, you know, it might sound a bit torturous to try to sit down and write you know, 1,700 words a day. So um, why would you encourage a newbie to try this? And I will, I'll let Sai go first since I skip, tried to skip her. Well, why do we subject ourselves to this? Why does anyone write a novel? It's because we have a story to tell. And if you have a story to tell and not a lot of time to do it, NaNoWriMo is the perfect excuse to sit down and write a novel because no one's expecting you to push out perfection. Any NaNoWriMo person who's been doing it for more than like 20 minutes will tell you, don't worry about being perfect. Just get the words on the page. It'll be over before you know. And by the end of the month, you'll be like, I can do it. And if you can do this in one month, you can literally do anything. So that's why I would suggest myself to it. And Hope that other people like it as well enough to do it. So. Who else would like to speak to that question? Genevieve? I like doing it because I've gotten to know myself as a writer. It's really important to know who you are as a writer. Do we have any gardeners here? Anybody who likes to have house plants or garden? <laughs> When you have a plant, you kind of get to know, hey, this plant likes this much light, this plant likes this much water. And it's just like getting to know yourself as a writer, like what helps you to succeed in your writing life? So do you write best in the morning? Do you write best with a lot of caffeine? Do you write best in a certain environment? So you don't know until you jump into the adventure and try it and say, oh gosh, if I start writing at the end of the day when I've had a bad day at work and it's 9 p.m., it's, it's not good for me. But if I wake up in the morning and I write then, that's my best time. So it's it's getting to know your own mind. It's, it's just a really fun experience to see your ideas come out on the page in a way you would have never spoken them or thought them. They only come out on that page when you're when you're doing this. I'm gonna let Andrew go first. All right. Um, I just want to say one of the big reasons I write is it's it's really kind of therapy for me. Um, there's a lot that you do when you write. There's a lot of mental processes going on. You have to excuse my dog here. She's excited. Um, she's excited for Nano. <laughs> but there's so many little things that you do when you write. It's more about than just telling a story. It's that's a very personal experience to a lot of writers and just being able to get those words out can actually be great for your, just your mind and your mental health. Art, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I, in order to do this, you do have to be a certain kind of crazy, um, but I think most people are. And for me, one of the things that was an unexpected delight the first year I did it and has happened every year is when your characters start taking control of their own destiny, um, which happens when you, when you write. You may have this very carefully laid out plan and you think you know what all is going to happen in the plot and every step of the way, but once you start writing it, the characters take on a life of their own and frequently aren't cooperative with your plans. And I've had many novels that have kind of gone awry and, and sometimes turned out better than what I had planned because the, the characters knew what they were about. And that's just such a, a delightful process. It's so much fun that it's something I look forward to experiencing every year. Anyone else wanna address that question? Why, why a newbie should try this? Why you do this every year? Go ahead, Ida. I'll just say briefly, um, I think this, you know, might depend on the person, but it is kind of a, a human experience that stories are how we make sense of the word world. And it's definitely true for me. So I just always have, I have so many more ideas than I will ever have time to write. And this is 
this is a good chance to to actually you know focus on that. Um, and it, it's also nice to, you know, even if you don't hit 50,000, if you hit 10,000, that's still a hard thing to do. And it's a good boost to say, hey, I did this really hard thing and I did it. Chloe you had something to share. I, I was going to reiterate what Genevieve said. Uh, you get to know yourself as a writer. You get to know what works for you. But the added bonus of NaNoWriMo is you can plan out a novel for an entire month, but the minute you have to sit down and produce the words every single day, and you know you're going toward that 50,000 words, you don't have time to overthink things. So you're gonna discover things about what your mind comes up with in that moment because you need to get another 500 words on the page. And sometimes those little moments of lightning are the thing that you take away that make your book the best when you're done. We have a question from Lisa in the chat, and it's it's sort of, you address some of this um, when Ida, you talk about making sense of the world or Andrew talking about writing as therapy, uh, but she wants to know what is your motivation to write? Self-expression, to be published, a creative outlet. So if you haven't already answered that question, or if you have another thought on what motivates you to write, what is that? Mary. I do it because it's fun. I mean, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, it's therapeutic, it's hard. It's a community of people that you love. And it's also fun getting to know yourself, getting to know your characters, uh, getting to know the people around you. That's fun for a lot of us. And so that's part of the reason we write. And, and if I may add, it's also kind of addicting. Like the more you write, the more you want to write. So, and, and, and that's one great thing about Nano is it might get those people that like start thinking like, I can't do this, but maybe I can just do 5,000 words. And so they set that goal. And so that first year, maybe they only do 5,000 words, but then they're like, you know what? That wasn't so bad. And so they start doing more and more and it really develops kind of your skills and your patience and really kind of feeds that addiction. It's a positive addiction though, not. Yeah. <laughs> Sigh. So kind of bouncing actually off what Genevieve said, how you said that you write and you learn about more about who you are as a writer. I started writing for NaNoWriMo just because like they said, it's fun, it's addicting. And over time you really do figure out who you are as a writer when you're just forced to sit down and just see what words come out and motivation I think changes over time so for me it started as something as just fun getting to know yourself and over time my personal mission for writing and what I hope NaNoWriMo is going to help me do is be able to crank out novels that I'll actually be able to help speak out to like LGBT youth to a lot of the people in the LGBT plus community and NaNoWriMo having to sit down every year and write something and figure out who you are as a person really helped every book you I read I'm like wow this gets gayer and gayer I what am I learning about myself what am I learning about the stories I want to tell and over time my motivation has been to maybe switch that into something that can help other people learn about themselves because that's really important to love yourself especially when you're a writer especially when you're a writer so. I love that answer thank you art has an answer yeah I'm kind of building off side like her I find that every year um, all of I at least have one character and often the protagonist who's from an, an underprivileged class LGBT may be part of it um, the last year's no the, two years ago I guess it was the, the one I published uh, was a uh, character that has schizophrenia so it, they all tend to be characters who are somehow dealing with oppression from society. And so I find a motivation to do that. And that's something I want to do more of. Uh, as you can tell by the gray beard, I'm not too many years away from retirement. And uh, my, my goal is to, to spend retirement doing a lot more serious writing. So my motivation to write for NaNoWriMo is frankly to become a better writer. The, the best way to learn to write is to do it. 
um, more than, than any class you can take, more than any reading you can do, the best way to, to improve your skill as a writer is to write. And so I, I look at these 50,000 words as you know a great writing exercise. And if I happen to come out with a great story out of it, that's gravy, you know, that, that's wonderful. But even if I don't, just having done it each year makes me a better writer. And, that, and that's definitely a motivation to, to write. Excellent. Um, we have another question from the chat. Sarah has a question about character. And Art, you started to talk about this earlier, I think. How do you develop your characters? She says hers are feeling a bit flat. So how do you make them feel more developed and real? And Ida, I'll call on you first. Um, I have a couple of suggestions that have worked for me. Um, it's uh, get to know your characters. Um, your character needs a goal. So think about what their goal is in the story. What's their problem that they need to solve or what's their goal and what's their fear. And that was, that's the one that works the best for me is, is I can identify my character's fear and have them face it. Then I, I get a lot of depth to them. That's a great tip, um, Andrew and Mary. So I found a writing exercise that I really liked. It was um, find out something mundane about your character. Um, so a lot of times you think about like really important things, fears, motivators and stuff like that. But if you stop and think, okay, what is, you know, beyond the favorite color, do they put milk in the bowl before the cereal? You know, then you start kind of thinking about your character a little bit more as a person instead of just a character. And then you can allow yourself more um, thought towards your character. And if they are flat this time you write it, they might not be next time. So. Yeah. And I might also add that a flat character is not always a bad character. Sometimes a flat character can help identify certain things, certain themes in a story. And there's places for flat characters and complex characters. And knowing the roles of your characters can be really important. And you don't have, a, a, a book will get tedious if you make every single character in your book a very complex character. But to kind of get on to, you know, way to develop the uh, character, uh, don't be afraid to just write a simple scene that is a situation that your character's got into. And you start thinking, how does this character deal with the situation? And it can be something mundane, like, like going, like say your character is going on a date for the first time. So write a date scene, even though that might not be a scene that your character will ever show in your in your plot, it can still help you kind of get that character in your mind. Any other tips for helping develop character? I've got one. Oh, go ahead, Chloe. Um, this kind of builds on what Ida was saying, but um, and not only knowing what your character wants, but ask yourself what your character doesn't want and what they're willing to do to avoid it. So if they need to change to get something they want, ask yourself, what are the steps they do to avoid it? Do they, do they drive an extra block away so that they don't have to confront another character? And then if there's a roadblock, what are they willing to do? They get out of their car and walk around the building. All of the things that they're willing to do so that they don't have to actually change is, um, will flesh out them a little bit more, make them a little bit more human. I know there are things that I avoid when I'm, when I don't want to do something and it helps. And the other thing I would suggest is if you have somebody who, um, that you trust with your characters, you can always do an interview. So have somebody interview you as though you are your character. Um, and if you have to answer those questions really quickly, sometimes your brain will just throw up something that'll be really good for your character motivation. I like that idea. I think Genevieve had an answer also. I think so. Genevieve, did you have a, a tip? I do. I'm really into having my characters have particular likes in music. And so when I'm really doing a scene with that character and I need to get into that mindset, I'll be playing the music that I imagine 
they like and it really helps me embody them. Another thing I like to do if I'm exploring a character and it's it's someone who it's hard for me to understand because it's a different personality. I look at the personality tests. When you look at, there's a lot out there. I think those are fun to take. And so I try to think, oh, well, let me see these characteristics. And it, it's a starting point because I can think, oh, well, this person, they're very traditional and they are like this. And then it, it helps me to start to frame who that person is when I'm coming from such a different perspective myself. So sometimes just looking at those personality tests can help me as well. So music and personality tests are two ways I approach them. This is so helpful. I mean, this, I'm, I'm not planning on participating this year, but I'm like, maybe I, maybe I should. This is, these are great, great ideas. Um, we have another question in the chat. Lisa would like to know about um, your experiences post NaNoWriMo. What have you done with your body of work? Sai. So my novel that I wrote three years ago, um, I actually queried and got a lot of good responses on it. And not saying anything, but knock on wood, hopefully pending a revise and resubmit, we have some good news in a year or so, maybe. But I mean, NaNoWriMo, as soon as you get that novel written, see what you can do with it. Give it to a beta reader, give it to query it, see what you can see where you could take it. You never know. You might get lucky or just it's fun. <laughs> Art. Um, most of my novels uh, that I've written in NaNoWriMo are, are exactly what I said earlier. They're great writing exercises and I finish them and I put them on the shelf because they're never going to go anywhere because they're crap. Um, and, and I'm okay with that. Um, I did have one that I, I was, that I thought worked pretty well. And so I took the time to edit it up uh, and send it to a whole bunch of beta readers and incorporated their responses and uh, ended up self-publishing it, which is another route. Size so going the traditional route, I did the self-publishing route. Um, and it sold a few copies. It ain't, you know, I'm not gonna ever get rich off it, but uh, I've gotten a lot, of, a lot of nice responses from it. So that's, that's motivation to keep doing it. Chloe. Um, I will note that in years past, I haven't done novels. I've done an anthology on a theme of short stories. Um, two of those short stories were the one that got me into Odyssey Writing Workshop. Um, they accept about 15 of the 3,000 applicants a year. So I was pretty pleased. Um, and after revising it, it got me in there. And then one of those stories afterwards was revised after the workshop. And it's been published in a UK press by um, Flame Tree. I have also been published in uh, several different uh, science fiction, fantasy, and horror magazines. Um, and several of those have come out of my anthologies that I've written during NaNoWriMo. Um, now, the caveat to that is both your mileage may vary, and they have been heavily revised after NaNo's over. So. Ida, go ahead. Um, I think I said this in my intro that, that last year after I finished the first draft of a novel I'd already been working on to finish out my, my words, I uh, wrote some short stories. So I did get one of those published. Um, the novel that I finished, I finished some novels. I think it took me about three novels to really get the idea of what I'm doing. The first two had major structural problems that I, I might redo someday, but the, the one I did finish last year, I'm still rewriting. My hope is that I'll self-publish it. Um, my goal is to self-publish it by, by the end of next year. I think this is good to hear that you're not, you're not coming at the end of this month with a perfectly crafted uh, novel. You are just getting the words out um, and, and getting that that first draft um, or just going through the exercise. Genevieve, did you have a something that you wanted to add? 
Yes, I, I feel like it's important at the end of Nano you know, to actually print out your work just because even if it's not 50,000 words, it's still impressive. And it just to have that tangible pile of paper that you created all those words, it's really gratifying. It's It just feels so substantial. So I have all of my writing, even if I wasn't going to publish it, I still print out a copy. So I have it in the physical form. It's just, it's a big accomplishment. It's hard work and it's a lot of energy and effort and celebrate that about yourself and make that real in the world. That's great. I like that having the tangible object. Um, we have another kind of nuts and bolts question. Elisa wants to know how you keep track of plot characters, story arc. What do you, what tools do you use? Spreadsheets, notes. Um, it's, I guess sort of related to that is, you know, how much of a, a planner are you and tracker and how much of a just are you just dive in and then worry about the other stuff later? Mary. So other than having um, pieces of paper and sticky notes and everything else that every writer has in their collection, I found a wonderful tool, uh, not sponsored, uh, called Airtable, A-I-R-T-A-B-L-E, don't ask the dyslexic to spell. Um, <laughs> it is kind of like using Excel spreadsheet, except for you can connect uh, multiple tables together. So you can have your characters in one table and you can have your scenes in another table. And then you can actually tag your characters in scenes and make filters later to see, hey, I'm actually, I'm curious, did I ever do anything with Spencer? Oh, he's only in two scenes. Do I really care about that character? Or, hey, he was in that scene. I can bring him back. So those are ways of, you know, doing stuff with it. It's my favorite tool. I've been using it for two years. So, and it's free uh, up, you know, up to like 3000 records or something beyond what you need for a novel. She, she also has a uh, kind of a murder, like bulletin board thing where doesn't any author? No. <laughs> Anyone else want to sign? I just want to say yes to the sticky notes because I have yet to meet someone who's like, there's no, there's papers everywhere. There's sticky notes everywhere trying to keep track of the plot. And I'm definitely looking up that air table because that sounds amazing. <laughs> so, but yeah, definitely sticky notes and Lots of paper and don't be afraid to make a mess during NaNoWriMo. You can clean it up in December. Go ahead, Art. I was going to say I use a, uh, a journal where I do all my story planning. I usually start about April making notes and probably a third of what's in there are questions rather than actual notes, I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself, I, would this be something I want to consider? Is this the way things work? Um, and so I find that that's really useful to me uh, during those dry periods when I'm kind of getting stuck, because I'll go back and look through it and see some of those questions. And sometimes I'll, I won't, I'll realize I haven't answered that question in my own mind yet. So I'll start writing to answer the question. Um, and that, that's really helpful for me. Uh, and doing it in a journal lets me kind of keep everything together so I don't have too many scattered pieces of paper. I've tried character sheets. Um, I, I used that last year where I had a separate piece of paper for each character that kept track of all, all of their characteristics. Um, it was a lot to keep track of. Um, and, and I find the character's voice is more important to me than all of their characteristics, just the way I write. Um, there's also a tool that I know some writers swear by and some writers swear at um, called Scrivener, which is um, a, a very popular tool. Um, it, very powerful for keeping track of characters and plot and, and all of those pieces um, and has a, a very intuitive uh, interface to it. It is not a free one, um, but I, they are a sponsor of NaNoWriMo, and if you participate in NaNoWriMo, uh, you can get a discount uh, towards getting Scrivener, which is, is a nice thing to, 
to experiment with. I've, I've played with it. It's, it's not my favorite tool. I'm more the swear at than swear by, but I know a lot of, a lot of writers who do swear by it. Andrew had a hand up. Yeah. Um, so I might be a little odd, but I don't really use anything like that. Um, my thought is if I'm going to explore a character or a plot, I don't have to write my story in order. So I will just hit a couple of, uh, you know, key returns. So I start kind of a new section and then I will just start writing a new scene. I have no idea where it's going to go, but for Nano, my thought is just get the words out there in any form. Maybe I'm just writing a character. Maybe I'm just writing a scene and I can get that plot and rearrange it some other time. Um, so I, you know, for me, it's just about getting the writing out there and not necessarily keeping track of the plot or the characters or, and sometimes you'll find things like that conflict and you just, you're like, okay, that's something I can either address and maybe it becomes a neat new conflict within the story, or maybe it's just something that gets edited out way after I'm done with Nano. So Chloe. I've got a weird one. And this is because I used to be a pantser and I've moved to being a plotter. So I, I, I vacillate between the two, but I find sometimes that outlines tend to be a little bit constricting feeling for me. I feel like I'm, I'm putting myself in a cage that I won't be able to get myself out of. So I have a dry erase board when I'm plotting and I will sketch it out on my dry erase board, take a photo of it with my phone so that later on, if I like it, I write it down in a notebook, but I will work out the whole entire um, outline of what I'm working on on a dry erase board and then take photos of it and then rearrange them that way. Um, the, the people who live with me like to say that it looks like I'm constantly solving somebody's murder. We have another kind of tool. Oh, go ahead, Genevieve. I just wanted to echo what Art mentioned about Scrivener. I, I love Scrivener. I'm a planner. I love the fact that I can move things around so easily. Scrivener also helps you to track your words. There's an interface where you can make kind of like little index cards and move them around that way, which is how I write in the physical world with index cards. So to do it digitally is a big help. I recommend Scrivener 100%. One year I wrote in Word, it's, I don't recommend that because it's just really difficult to edit later on. Whereas Scrivener, it's really easy to move those sections. So I'm one of those writers who does swear by Scrivener. And I think it's around $30. It's not terribly expensive. Then it's worth it for me in the editing process down the road. So I would be one of those ones like Art said, swear by Scrivener. That dovetails nicely into the question we have in the chat, which is what do you use to do the actual writing? So you use Scrivener, but um, do other people use Microsoft Word or Google Docs or Handwrite? Oh, we got, everybody wants to jump in on this one. Ida, I'll let you go first. I have mostly used Microsoft Word. Um, I'm not such a visual person, I don't think, that like people who organize things on, on bulletin boards, I'm like, that's just not how my brain works. Um, I, but I, I'm kind of, I'm transitioning to Google Docs now because then I can, you know, if I'm not on my one device where I had it saved, you know, I can just go ahead and, and pull it up. Um, so it works for me. I think Mary and Andrew both were waving their arms enthusiastically. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I kind of have two things that I, I use a lot. Um, I, the first is a program called YWriter. And it's got, a, it's a free program. It's got a lot of things um, where you can like create characters, uh, objects, uh, settings. You can rearrange the, a lot of the scenes. You do chapters. It's, it's a really powerful tool. And it's designed by a guy that's both a programmer and a, an author. So he, he built the tool that he wanted to use. But then the other thing I use is I do a lot of handwriting, like just pen and paper. And I just kind of have this thing where 
I feel like I'm at my most creative when I'm just, I've got like a journal, uh, like a, like a journal you just, um, I kind of like, you know, kind of a little particular, I kind of like a little leather bound little journal. It's just, it's just something really cool about writing in, but I'll take that pen and I'll write down and I just kind of, I'll put like earbuds in, and I'll just kind of lose myself to the writing. And for me, just doing that handwriting is, there's just something special about that feel of ink on page. But then I also find that when I'm transferring, you know, from that to like, cause I'll take that and I'll go in and later, like a, maybe another day and I'll start typing that in. And I'll find that I'll take that core amount of what I wrote and I'll add about another thousand words as I'm like, oh yeah, and this and this. And so it's kind of a, an extra way for me to get words. I think that uh, personally, you need to write with what you have. So I have written in Microsoft Word, in Google Docs, and handwritten journals. And my favorite currently is called Dabble Writer, which is very similar, but much more user friendly and slimmed down than Scrivener or even Y Writer. Um, yeah, Y Writer is not user friendly. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, but I think it's really important for, in, you know, we're going to say all of our favorite tools, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the tool that you can use to write the words. You don't have to have the special tool. It's if you only have pen and paper, use pen and paper. If you if you have access to Microsoft Word or Google Docs, just write in there. You'll and get the words down. You know, we've been doing this for years, so we have our particular things that we like. And you know, if you want to ask me later, you join and you're, you you want to ask me on the Discord, what's the thing that you like? Reach out to me and I'll tell you. But at the end of the day, it's what you have and what you are comfortable working in. Go ahead, Art. Um, I want to echo what Mary said. First off, is, is there are so many great tools out there. Um, I've used one called Noveler that wasn't mentioned there, which is a web-based one of doing it. But the, the one thing I would say is whatever tool you use, make sure um, there is a way either in the tool or you do it separately to back up what you write every day. Um, I've seen people um, late in November lose everything due to a hard disk crash. And it is, it's a painful thing to see. I can't even imagine what it's like to experience. So uh, whatever you use, make sure that whether it's backed up because it's on the cloud or you, you're actually making physical backups or you email yourself a copy of it or something, but make sure you have a backup. Sigh. So as someone who's a new mom with writing tools, I might not be able to get to a laptop because my hands might be full some of these times. So what I would recommend is what I'm going to attempt to do this year is I'm gonna get a recorder and I'm going to try to record my words audibly. And then I'm going to try to transcribe them later. We'll see if it works. But I mean, any way that gets words out of your head and into the universe, go for it. Especially if you're a new mom, because trust me, you need it. <laughs> so another kind of tool question. Does anyone use um, anything like Grammarly or Pro Writing Aid after November? Um, and for those of us who don't know what those things are, um, what are those? Sorry, oh, sorry, Chloe. Grammarly is a is a um, yeah. editing tool, and it is a lot like Scrivener. If you spend your days editing, you either love it or hate it. <laughs> um, if, if you have a particular, it finds, uh, it will make word suggestions. Um, I write sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, so quite frequently it thinks I'm misspelling things I'm not. Um, that's, that is one of the things that I constantly have to tell Grammarly, no, that's that's the character's name. No, no, that's where they're at. So 
Um, it's very helpful if you want to check things like a standard spelling, standard punctuation, that sort of thing. It'll really point those out if you're trying to polish something that you're going to submit. So it's very helpful that way, you know, as a last pass, if you don't have somebody who is a beta reader for you or somebody who's really good at line edits. So it can be helpful. Genevieve. The one I like, and I just do sections, it's called Hemingway app and it's online. It's a free website. I don't do the whole, I just, if I'm working on a section I'm editing, I just copy it, paste it in there and it gives you suggestions if you're using too many adverbs and it does it in different colors, which I like, it's colorful. So it's kind of a fun way to edit. And it's Heming, I think it's, is it HemingwayApp.com or if you just Google Hemingway app, it's easy to find. Sorry. Hemingway is also really good too. If you're writing a young adult novel or anything like that, it'll tell you like the age reading limits of it and stuff like that. So that's a really helpful tool because I write young adults. So that's really helpful to be like, teenagers never say like I'm 30 now almost. I mean, I'm not a teen, but it's really helpful for that too. Those are great. Um, I've never heard of those tools. I had to go ahead. I don't use any of those tools, but uh, what's helpful to me is that I do have beta readers. I, I'm in, found some. I'm in a writing group, and and it, it's just really helpful to have, especially if you can get more than one person to look at your stuff. You know, if like I've got four other people in this group, and if they all say I wasn't clear on what you meant there, then I know that's something that needs to be changed. So I think I think that a beta reader is just like your best, most valuable tool you can have. I have a, a oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, I just want to say that before you really do anything, no matter what you do, like post November, set it aside for a while. Like, don't even look at it. Like, just, just forget you wrote a novel for a month or two. Because when you do come back to it, you'll have such a fresh perspective and you kind of know uh, you'll see things that you never would have seen if you had immediately gone into editing that's a uh, common advice for nano as well go ahead chloe also, it's very helpful if you take your entire manuscript and you put it in a font that you don't normally read or work in. Um, seeing it in a different font will make you read it a different way. Um, go from serif to sans serif because you read serif to sans serif differently. It's very helpful. You'll catch a lot of mistakes or things you put in there twice that you wouldn't normally see. Andrew. Uh, one other piece, if you're really going to do a deep dive and you're doing your self editing, and that's the other thing is I don't really do a lot of these tools because for one, I, I've studied English, I, I've read enough, I feel like I have a strong enough grasp of grammar that a lot of times I will disagree with some of the tools. I'm like, no, I, I wanted that specific structure to a sentence, right? So, so a lot of those times, those, those grammar tools just annoy me, make me mad. <laughs> But if you're going to do a deep dive into something, another good tip is break out your like break out what you're right what you've written into sections, and then do those sections line by line backwards, because you're removing all of the actual context of the story, and you're just looking at the language. Also, reading your story aloud or using yeah. a, um, a a text to voice. Um, really helps me catch stuff. I'm dyslexic. I literally could have four of the same word in a row. I might not catch it. Um, but a text reader is going to tell me that I put the same word in there three times, you know? Um, so that's something that helps me for rhythm and pace and stuff like that. We have a uh, question about how do you join the community? Art, right, I'm gonna let you answer that one. If so, we've got people here who, who wanna plunge in. How do they join NaNoWriMo and how do they get connected with the Columbia region? Uh, it's pretty simple. You wanna go to the website 
nanorimo.org. That's N A N O W R I M I. I don't remember. Someone put the link in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, nanorimo.org. Uh, you can sign up there. It doesn't cost anything to participate. Um, once you sign up, uh, you, if you go to the community section of the menu bar, it'll allow you to select your home region uh, and you kind of drill down to it. So our region is USA, Missouri, Columbia. Um, and because we're virtual this year, regardless of where you're listening from, feel free to join Columbia. I imagine so I would say the same thing about joining Tucson. Um, it's all it's all virtual. Um, and uh, that will get you tied in to get uh, feedback from the ML for that region about what things are going on. Uh, there will be most regions have Zoom meetings or, or similar type process. Uh, many of them, including Columbia, also have a Discord server for people who like to use Discord. Um, that's a, a nice way to participate as a community. Um, in normal years, there are lots of get togethers as well for, for doing writing. We won't be doing that this year, um, but really just go to the website, get yourself signed in. It's, it's quick and it's easy. Thank you, Art. We have um, one last question. I, oh, sorry, Discord dashboards. You couldn't really understand what, what that is. Uh, Discord, D-I-S-C-O-R-D. Um, it is an, uh, an application which is uh, originally designed for gaming for people who do online gaming. Uh, but it uh, allows kind of a community chat. Uh, you can break your so-called Discord server, and there's a, a Columbia uh, NaNoWriMo Discord server uh, into various topics that each have their own discussion area. So it's kind of a, a nice way to to, uh, to to chat with your, your fellow participants in the region. And the link for uh, the Discord server is on the uh, Columbia regional area of the webpage. So once you uh, get registered with NaNoWriMo, and select Columbia as, as either your home region or just a region that you're in, um, you'll be able to, to go to that community section and find the link to the Discord server. Thanks, Art. Mary? I was going to add, I am one of the people who is running that Discord ser server. I'm on it every single day, um, most of the day. So if you have any questions and you hop on there and you say, help, I don't know what I'm doing, I'll be able to see that and I'll, you know, reach out. I'm also going to maybe post some like writing prompts and, you know, some sprints and stuff like that. So there, there'll be things to be that you can participate in on the Discord if you want to. Um, I'll also be using the normal community forums as well. So you won't be missing out too much by only doing one or the other, but. Mary is basically a, an unofficial ML for Columbia. Thanks for doing that, Mary. Um, so here in our final minutes, as we've been having this dialogue, someone wants to know about using dialogue. Uh, so does anyone have a few final thoughts on using dialogue in your writing? Tips for using dialogue. Sai, Sai, go ahead. People watch. It can be done by introvert, extrovert. I usually like to go to Starbucks and just hear what people are saying. And then that also helps with character development as well, where they don't feel flat because you're taking people. So just listen, watch your favorite TV shows, listen to what they're saying. Art? I find it really useful to make sure you know what you're each of your main characters' voices sound like um, so that you can hear their voice in your head. Um, because you, if you can't hear them speaking, you'll be writing something that isn't really dialogue. It comes out as description. Um, but if, but if, you, if you're just transcribing what you hear them saying in your head, then, then it comes out as believable dialogue. 
Chloe. Um, a good a good way to study this and go to your local library. You can find it there. You can find scripts, uh, TV scripts, play scripts, those sorts of things, because they distill dialogue down to not just because dialogue has to be more than just what you would hear two people say. It has to be distilled down to um, something that's readable because I could have a conversation with you and say um 15 times and you don't want to put that in your in your dialogue. Um, another thing to do is uh, is uh, figure out the thing that your character doesn't want to talk about. <laughs> I feel like I'm a lot about what my characters are hiding, but um, figure out the thing, make a list of five words that describe what your character doesn't want to talk about in that dialogue, and it will up the tension in your dialogue. So if they're avoiding those words, but they're having a conversation with somebody who wants to know something about those words, um, it, it helps you flesh out what your characters are saying. Go ahead, Ida. I just wanted to add, don't, um, don't have people be too grammatically correct. You know, people, if your characters are talking to each other, don't have it be like they're presenting a formal speech to a crowd. You know, people interrupt each other. And um, that's part of, I think, what Art was saying about the different voices. You know, people have their own voice and will, uh, you know, it's not like one person presents their five paragraph, whatever, and then the other person waits for them to finish all of their points and then rebuts. It's a lot more give and take. All right, thank you. Um, we are right at eight o'clock, so um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. This has been super helpful. Um, maybe, gosh, I'm tempted. Maybe I will do NaNoWriMo again this year. Um, <laughs> so, um, Art, once again, what the we've got the website um, in the chat, NaNoWriMo.org. So, if you are wanting to sign up and join the Columbia Region, please do that. Um, and stay connected with one another through the virtual write-ins, um, the Discord server, and the forums on NaNoWriMo. I want to thank everyone for um, sharing your time and expertise with us. This has been very, very helpful and generous. And thanks to those of you who attended. Um, and it, we will have this recording up on our website in a couple days. So if you want to tell your friends for inspiration, they can come check it out. Um, please do so. And everyone enjoy the rest of your evening.